Okay. Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our evening Dhamma session. Had an interesting, uh, very something interesting happened on the bus again today. Buses are, of course, interesting places. A woman spilt her coffee on me this evening. Dropped the whole mug between me and another woman. But. Um, the man in the wheelchair got back on, same guy, and uh, asked the bus driver why he, uh, why his white, why he had a, was growing his beard out, whether he was growing it out for the 25th, he said. An Indian man, though. I think he really didn't quite, quite understand what Christmas was. I thought this bus driver with the white beard was growing it out for for Christmas. So it made me think maybe we should talk about culture. Culture is an interesting topic. So in this context, culture is a very conceptual thing has to do with not only people but groups of people that's not so interesting uh, f for meditators so keeping it in the spirit of meditation I mean there are some interesting aspects of culture what it boils down to on an individual level it comes down to what I've been talking about recently and th this idea of the personality And part of our job as meditators is to recognize, therefore, our culture. What part of us is culture? And so these are good examples how in modern globalized society we find culture sh cl cultures clashing. We say how people get in, in the way of us understanding each other. Culture is, culture is something, incidentally, as a, that I've felt quite strongly as a Western Buddhist monk. It's funny, as soon as you, when you become a monk and you, you especially when you don't use money. You become very close to the culture in which you live. And you're very much... You see the culture in a whole new way, like similar to how uh, uh, any other homeless uh, beggar would. You know, you're no longer privileged. You no longer have any status in society, so you get to see... Uh, the very dregs of society and so you wind up very much caught up in culture and as a foreigner that can be quite difficult so I felt culture quite strongly it's an interesting as a result quite interesting it's often tied up with things like nationalism it's very much caught up in the past and a identity that's very much caught up in our in a his history. It's about identity and in, in ethnicity, skin color. There's so many uh, gender. All of these are very strong 
have a, a very strong impact on our our relationships and on our, and consequently on our lives. We were having a debate over this new movement to try and get get uh, to create a obligation in society to call people by whatever gender they prefer to be called by not just male or female but it could be any number of constructed genders which is interesting as a Buddhist because we would agree that gender is somewhat of a construct physical besides the physical there's nothing there's nothing mental about gender so you can decide to be whatever gender you want to be about smacks of egoism and identification and and that's really the point that's how it all ties in here culture culture can be quite a terrible thing and for the most part i would argue it is a negative thing now where culture is useful is where it protects culture can sometimes be an extension of religion so you'll often see Buddhist culture can be quite beautiful can be a lot of problems with many Buddhist countries that I've lived in just as there are problems everywhere but there's some very beautiful things that you find in these cultures that are not exactly Buddhism there are many methods and means of performing good deeds a lot of charity work is systematized you know, simplified and this result becomes a, a very much a part of people's lives they've assimilated into who they are i am someone who gives we our culture is one of giving for example our culture is one of keeping moral precepts our culture is one of meditation culture is a lot like an, an eggshell or or a, a casing in this way it, it's a protector it protects religion because it becomes tradition religion, religious views and beliefs, practices, experiences become enshrined in the culture. That's where it's useful. The problem is we begin to take culture as religion. So we begin to take traditions, you know, the practices that we've uh, cult we've we've uh, manufactured we take them to be in and of themselves important I was just thinking about this now I just had a shower because I like to shower before I teach the Dhamma and I was thinking what a silly thing but it's a gesture but you see this is this sort of thing how this can, can become a, a ritual so I do it because it feels like, well, it's respectful to when you're teaching the Dhamma. It's actually in the text, this is a thing where before teaching they would they would bathe. So keeping with tradition and out of respect for the Dhamma, because I hadn't showered today, I had a shower. But it's silly because you know Buddhism is not at all about physical cleanliness you could argue that it somehow makes you g gives you good concentration we often have our meditators to forgo showering when they get to the really intense parts we tell them to stop showering because it 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 resets things you know it, it it's a comfort it's a way of it's not such a big deal here in 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 the west specifically talking about showering but uh, if you'd ever lived in Southeast Asia, you'd understand the, the, the importance of it because if you don't shower twice a day, people start to think there's something wrong with you, even if you don't smell. It's a big part of the discourse. Have you showered yet? It's a big part of 
Thai society anyway. So telling a Thai person not to shower is is a lot worse than other thing, any other thing you could tell them not to do. Well, maybe not. But you see, this is culture. Culture can be good, but it should never be mistaken for religion. Religion being the views and being the, the content behind the reasons why you're doing it. Our rituals should not be more important than the purpose for them. So, but anyway, that mostly is about culture on a conventional level. But I thought it's interesting because it boils down, it ties into uh, a person, the inner workings of a person's mind. We come into the meditation practice with an identity. So much cultural baggage, right? Even if we think we don't, and often we think we don't. Sri Lankan people don't think they are specifically you know, some, somehow odd for being Sri Lankan. It's just the ordinary way of being, except when you're not a Sri Lankan or Thai or Canadian. And I like to think as a Canadian, I don't have, I'm not cultured, but oh boy, we have a real culture. It's funny, I was walking down the hallway and It's so much, it's so wonderful as a Canadian because it's just it's our culture. When uh, when you turn because the hallways and these narrow hallways and all the students coming out of their classes, and so if you turn a corner and there's you're facing someone, you say sorry, and they say sorry, and then you go on your way. That's the culture. We both apologize. It's Canadian. It really is every time. And so it was funny. I did this once. And I said sorry, and this, she was Asian, she had Asian features, and she said, she said something like, uh, it's okay, or something like that, but like it was, and it was so, it was so jarring, but it was like she was trying to reassure me, and I'm like, no, I'm, you know, I'm really not upset, it's just, this is what we, I didn't say that, it was just quick, a quick exchange, but it was the wrong exchange, she gave the wrong answer. So I'm definitely, cult we're all definitely cultured. But for an Asian person, or, or even an American, this is absurd. We didn't do anything, why are you apologizing? When I do it in America, it's, it's quite funny, the response. They're like, what? Sorry. But now they know, oh, you must be from Canada. So we come with this. This is who we are, our personalities. Most of us are very much have a lot of a lot invested in our personalities that are important to us, and then we bring this to religion. We say, "Well, I believe." As a Buddhist, it's quite irksome to hear people say, "I believe," as though it was meaningful. It's like, who cares? <laughs> I really don't care what you believe. It's meaningless to me. I mean, that's the modern society is all about what you believe. It's about expressing your beliefs and having a plurality of beliefs. And Buddhism is like rubbish. Throw it all out. Whatever beliefs you could possibly espouse is meaningless. You know, the Buddha was, was quite pointed in this. He said, when you say I believe something, well, you're doing a good thing. You're doing a good thing because you're not saying this is true. If you say, I believe X, it's better than saying X is true. That's not better, it's it's less committal, right? But it's a clever thing that he did to say this. I mean, this is the point, is that when I say I believe X, it's really quite meaningless. As, as far as X, it's quite meaningful in terms of understanding you. What a person believes says a lot more about them than than it does about what is true. Of course, Buddhism is much more interested in what you've learned, in what you know, 
And by know we mean by having learned it, by having seen it. Right. The, the emphasis on the term vipassana, meaning to see clearly. It's nothing to do with belief, it's nothing to do with conjecture. And consequently, it's nothing to do with who you are. It's nothing to do with your personality. Meditation should not reaffirm who you are. It should tear it down. <laughs> it should challenge the very core of who you are. It's quite disconcerting to have your ego ripped out from under you. But that's what meditation does. That's what it's for. And so I've often argued, I think there's an argument that could be made that The only culture a Buddhist should have is Buddhist culture. Your culture shouldn't be shouldn't be Canadian or American or Sri Lankan. And I think it's too harsh because when you're whenever when whatever culture you're in when dealing with ordinary people, you have to conform to their culture. But I think that goes with this point, is that a really good Buddhist can fit into any culture, because the only culture they have of their own is Buddhist culture. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means anything. Buddhist culture may mean no culture. I think there are certain... certain customs of the Buddha and customs of the followers of the Buddha. But it's quite different from having your own mental culture, your own personality. And so when we all look at our when we look at our cultures, when we look at our personalities, we have to understand that none of this is at all related to the practice. You can't bring this to the practice. You can't practice to promote this or to enhance your own personality. And in the, in the end, the clinging to personality gets in the way of our meditation practice. So with all this, I'm practicing for this reason or that reason, or I, one meditator today said to me, I prefer this, as I think a good example. Because it's meaningless what you prefer. It's like, I don't really care what you prefer. It has no bearing on your practice, or should have no bearing on your practice whatsoever, except the fact that you prefer it, which is an interesting state in and of itself. And understand, and so the, the real thing is, Asking ourselves what our personality means There may be aspects of our personality that are beneficial, that are helpful, that are useful for us But not because they're ours Right? They should be good because they're good They shouldn't be good because they're ours And so we have to examine, we don't have to reject who we are But we have to deconstruct it Because it's only made up of moments Moments of experience that become habits And like any habit they can be built up and they can be torn down What's important is to see clearly so we can dis dif discern and differentiate The good habits from the bad habits That's what we do in meditation So I think we should all be quite careful in our Our investigation and, and and understanding our own culture and how we've been cultured and indoctrinated and what we take for granted. A lot of people come to spirituality with baggage and with, with ideas about what meditation should be. It should be comfortable, it should be pleasing, it should be calming, it should be easy. <laughs> it should be easy. I think that's the worst one. Why should it be easy? Why should it be easy? Why should happiness be easy? Right? This is what we the, the greatest fallacy of of the modern world, I think, is that happiness should be easy. 
and we act in such a way we we uh, we think we're getting happiness all the time we're getting happier and happier why is this look at how easy it is to get happiness turn on the television it's happiness turn on the computer it's happiness turn on the music it's happiness open the fridge it's happiness lie in your bed it's happiness so many happinesses so we all should be really really happy in society right we're not so funny because we think we are we pretend that we are if you ever asked us do these things lead to happiness you know do these things make you happy of course they do but i think if you ask the same people often are you happy they might not admit it but to you but be quite clear that they're actually not all that happy some of the, the most intent upon sensual gratification are often the most depressed, even suicidal. I, mean, I went through teen teenage years intent upon complete debauchery in all ways. And I've never been so unhappy. That was the most unhappy period of my life. Well, it's the teen years as well, but there's nothing happy about the debauchery, about chasing after sensual pleasures of all kinds. So, in this and in all things, we should not take anything for granted. It was fun. I was when I was in Los Angeles. I did this often with the Thai people, and one man he said. He, he he caught me. He 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 caught the the trend of my thinking. Someone would say something, and I'd say, "Are you sure?" And I did this several times, and he caught me. And he said, "Uh oh." When he says, "Are you sure?" You know, there's a problem, because then I would challenge it. Thai culture can be very fixed and set in ways that it's not always beneficial. You know, Socrates, I think, would do this. It's not that he didn't agree with you. It's that he, he, he wondered why you, why you took it for granted. So he would ask you questions about it. The Buddha would do this as well. You don't have to tell people they're, what they're doing is wrong. That's not the point. I mean, the, the, a bigger point is people don't question. We often don't question. We take things for granted. This is right. This is who we are. The whole um, I mean, there's many examples. One example is of not eating meat. People say if you eat meat, it's just like killing. And so we have this big problem as Buddhists because we're not strictly vegetarians, as Theravada Buddhism anyway, Tibetan Buddhism as well. I think. And then, well, if you if you if you if you don't kill, how can you eat meat? Things like that. I mean, why I bring that one up is because when you get into a conversation trying to explain it, you can see that the way people look at things is just so different, and we the, the way we the way we look at the world. Well, the way we look at the world is, as Buddhists is quite different from the way ordinary people look at the world. We're not concerned about people die, about beings dying. We're concerned about the act of killing. When I eat meat, I'm not killing. I'm not doing anything harmful. So the, I mean, what this points to is the idea that, in this example, that um, ethics is something intellectual, that you have to think about what's right and what's wrong. In Buddhism, you don't think about what's right and what's wrong. You just have a wholesome mind state when your mind is wholesome that's wholesome that's ethical anyway lots of examples of it I thought this would be a good thing to point out to us how we take certain things for granted and how we come with come to the practice with all sorts of baggage that ties into this idea of 
meditation as being something separate from our personality. Because personality is all tied up with ego and identification. And as you practice, you start to tear that down. You start to see it for what it is as a torture device, something that tortures us by forcing us to take certain positions and to get angry and belligerent when people threaten our, us or question us or I was thinking again about this guy in the wheelchair the first time when when the guy responded and that's really it there's always going to be people who do stupid things you know who who act in belligerent ways But it's up to it, the, the real problem comes when we when we respond. You know, we all have culture, and our culture conflicts with each with other people, and our culture conflicts with our experience. Meaning, what we want things to be, how we want things to be, is often different from how they are, and how what we want is often based on. Well, it's usually based on our personality, our, our habits, including our culture. And so we're always going to come up with these conflicts. The question is how we react. The Buddha said this for this reason. When someone gets angry, it's worse. The worse, it's bad to be angry, of course. But the person who replies with anger does a worse thing. Because they create the problem. This is the way it goes with all things. You're always going to have things like anger. When even when you meditate, you'll get angry at times. You'll get upset at times. That's bad. It's not good. It's it's stressful. It causes you suffering. But what's worse is when you reply to it, get upset about it. And so anyway, these are some thoughts on culture and on the baggage that we come to the meditation practice with. It's uh, quite useful to keep in mind that who we are, who we are should have no impact on the meditation except to be studied as an object of meditation because we are the subject in, med in, in insight meditation. With other meditations the subject or the object might be something external to ourselves. No, in this one, we are studying ourselves. We are both the lab technician and the lab rat. So, you learn about yourself, you learn about your culture, your, your views, your beliefs, and so on. This is what leads us to freedom. This is what leads us to peace. Once we're able to let go of who we are. Anyway, so there you go. There's the Dhamma for tonight. A little few thoughts on culture. Thank you all for coming out. Apologies that we're still stuck in second life. Someone commented today that they don't like these Second Life videos. Well, there are some good sides to Second Life. We've actually got a community here. You guys can go. It's nice to be able to see that I've got an audience. You can do the real-time chatting. Well, at the same time, we are recording, so... People can watch on YouTube or they can listen. We have live audio and then the audio is, is recorded to the website. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you want to comment, if you have thoughts on culture of your own,
culture is such an interesting topic. It's interesting when you've traveled the world and seen other people's cultures. There's a difference between people who have left their own culture and people who haven't. Not 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 you know life changing different, but there is something, something you see when you've seen other people's cultures and realize how your own culture is not the only way people live. It feels like we hold the Theravada culture apart from other types of Buddhism. Is this wrong? Well, it's, you know, there's a problem, right? Because other people call themselves Buddhism and they teach things that we say, well, that's not, uh, that's not the same as what we teach. I, there is a problem sometimes where we, yes, we, we, we do, we cling to our school as being different from your school. And then it becomes an identity, right? And it's, it's just another problem. And, and so what you find is that the similarities, we, 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 we are blind to the similarities. It's funny when I, sometimes when I meet other types of Buddhists, you can just feel that there's there's this sort of ego and and I mean I even have have friends who it, it feels like they're looking down upon me because I'm a, the wrong type of Buddhist, you know. And we do this as well. And Theravada Buddhism is the only pure Buddhism, yeah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the Buddha wasn't like that. The Buddha was. Uh, if people say things He was about the teachings, right? If what they teach is true, I agree with it If what they teach is false That which they teach is true Well, I agree with that That which they teach is false Well, I disagree with that So, in that sense We would differentiate ourselves Based on the teachings um, Calling yourself a Theravada Buddhist Is like a, like all identities it, it has a practical value Because you don't have to explain I believe A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You can just say I'm a Theravada Buddhist, and for many people, that's already meaningful. You know, that's a set of beliefs already grouped together in a useful way. So, I mean, with all things, it's about how you. With things like this, it's about how you use it and how you relate to it. As to having a Theravada actual culture, though. I mean, there, there isn't one really. There's a Thai Buddhist culture. There's a Sri Lankan Buddhist culture, and they're quite different. There's a, a Cambodian and Lao are fairly similar to Thai, though still different. And then there's Burmese. So, uh, you know, so the the few aspects of actual Theravada culture we might have are. Uh, relating to our privileging of the one Buddha, the historical Buddha. Um, but not even so much. The the appreciation of the Arahant as a as a valid goal. I mean just our Buddhism does Theravada Buddhism does have a specific flavor to it. Next semester I'm enrolled in Introduction to Buddhism And today we just got the syllabus I don't know if I'm actually going to follow through with it Because it says And i got to take he's a, he's a, The teacher is a friend of mine so, But he's a Tibetan Buddhist And so the syllabus says We'll be studying Buddhism as it's practiced in, in as, it, as it appeared in India Tibet, China and Japan I think <laughs> like they just missed a whole half the picture. What about Southeast Asia? There'll be nothing from Sri Lanka. They'll miss that whole tradition of from Sri Lanka. Is that is that the idea here? Which is going to be unfortunate. I'd like to talk to him about it. Um. But yeah, Theravada Buddhism, I guess, does have its own culture. 
to some extent. As I said, I mean, I think the, the, the real, the simple answer is that as with all cultures, like Canadian culture, I think there's some really good things about it. But they shouldn't be good things because they're Canadian, or because I'm Canadian. They should be good because they're good. And there are a lot of things about Canadian culture that I might think as a Canadian are, yes, I'm proud of those things. But then as a Buddhist, I think, wait a minute, that's wrong. Like our penchant for drinking strong beer, for example. Yes, our beer's stronger than the Americans. We're proud of that. As a Buddhist, not so much. So same goes with, say, Theravada culture. It's not that it's Theravada that it's good. It's good because it's good. So we would say there are probably aspects of Theravada culture that are good. Or at the very least, harmless. And there are others that could potentially be harmful. I guess if you want a better answer, you'd have to give me something specific. No other questions? Yeah, culture, that's a good topic, I think. Good thing to think about. There's aspects that tie into our own practice. Maybe tomorrow we'll take on science. Science is the other of the three. I have this trifecta, or this tr triad. Science, religion, and culture. Three very interesting things. Tomorrow we'll attack science. I suppose science is one of them. I don't know. We'll talk about science tomorrow. And then we'll try to put it all together. All right. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all good practice.